Hey, everybody, we are locked and loaded for the latest edition of Gun on One. It is powered by the Inside the Birds Network. I'm Derek Gunn. Eagles on a three-game roll. They thoroughly dismantled the Cincinnati Bengals. I don't know how many people saw that coming, but it was a thorough beatdown by your Philadelphia Eagles. And I guess it's safe to say they have turned the corner. My guest for this particular show is a guy I've gotten to know shortly after I got here, and he's become a good friend, a great colleague. He is the radio voice color analyst of your Philadelphia Eagles, the one and only former Eagle legend, Mike Quick. My brother, Mike, what's up, dog? <laughs> All is well, D. You know, it's always sunny in Philly when the Eagles are winning. You know yep. that. Yep. It's you know, sunny in Philly. You know, it's funny. Uh, I expected you to be grand grandbaby babysitting, and, and I don't see any grandbabies. What happened? Yeah, this is not our day. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, we do have those days, but this is not our day. But see, okay. they're like kids now start school really early. So now they yeah. have like three or four days a week now where they're going to a preschool and like, yeah. come on, man, let me have my babies for a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, my, yeah, my three-year-old granddaughter now goes to a yes. preschool Monday through Thursday from 9 to 11 a.m. And I'm like, same, Wait. same. We get, we, we're doing the same thing. Yes. But then again, the parent, the parents get to say, Whew. yes, oh, they get a break. Yeah. They get, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My son and his wife, they, they're happy about that because they get a break. I don't blame. All right. Let's, let's, let's get down to the X's and O's. And, and, and Mike, man, what a, uh, what a performance by the Eagles on Sunday in Cincinnati. And, you know, as I said a few moments ago, this team has, has turned the corner. And, and what have you noticed about the difference in this team over the last two games compared to how they were functioning three, four weeks ago. Gunny, I just think it takes a while. And, and you know, you go into these seasons now where you don't have a, a lot of live anything during training camp yeah. and even the preseason games, they really, because you don't play <clears throat> the starters very much, it's really hard to hit the ground running. There's so many moving parts. There's, there's so much so many things that have to come together. There's so much synergy. Um, just the way that everything is coordinated. It's hard to get everything working right away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we as fans, even analysts, <clears throat> from week to week, we're expecting something that's just not, especially in the early part of the season. Mm -hmm. But I think as time progresses, as this team starts to, one, understand one another, uh, with these new coordinators, understanding what he has and strengths and weaknesses of all of his guys defensively and Kellen Moore on the offensive side. I think you start to grow with one another and with what you can expect them to do, what they can do. And, you know, as fans, we expect them to hit the ground running, win every game. And that's just not realistic. Yeah. And we live from week to week with these teams and the results week to week. It's not reality. The reality in the National Football League now is when the season starts, it's almost like training camp from back in the 80s where you're just getting to know where you're just you're starting to really get full, full, like on contact, full movement, uh, pre-snap, post-snap, all of these things that has to that you have to coordinate and have and have to be in sync. And I just believe D, that they're just starting to get to where. They're starting to get in sync. Coaches understand who's good, what they can do well, and all of these things that, that have to come to fruition before you can really take off and be the team that you have the potential of being. I think we're starting to see that now. Did you think it would take this long, uh, or did you think it would it would click sooner? So I, I generally believe that it takes the first three or four games, okay. and then you start to round into shape. I remember Bill Belichick talking about that even years ago, like the, the first quarter of the season when it was just a 16 game season mm -hmm. is when he really starts is to figure out who he has, what his team really is and what they're going to be. And it takes that first quarter to see the first four games. Yep. I want to hone in for a moment on this young man, Saquon Barkley. Um, he has been the perfect compliment. The place to start. For, for this Eagles offense, and I think he's exceeded. We all knew he was an exceptional back, but I think he's even exceeded many of our expectations. Right now he's number two in the NFL in rushing. Yes, He's only like 234 yards away from 1,000 yards, and we're only seven games into his career here in Philadelphia, and he's doing it 
on 18 carries a game. You know, most guys like that, like a Derrick Henry, 25, 28, 29 yeah. carries a game. This yeah. young man is averaging 18 carries a game, and he's close to 1,000 yards. Tell me what you've seen of him as you've watched him closely, and tell me some areas that he's surprised you in some ways. I think he's just special in every way. You yeah. hit it. He is just a very special young man. Um, we'll talk about just the football. I just think he's special in every aspect. But um, his ability to make people miss at mm -hmm. his size, at 200 and maybe 30 pounds, he's a big – his lower body is just amazing to me. Ooh. But his ability at his size to make people miss is really what has surprised me. Um, the jump cuts, the acceleration. And, and some of these things I saw when he was with the Giants, but now to watch him – and, you know, part of it is he knows now that he's got an offensive line in front of him that are going to give him some opportunities to crease the defense, to get to the second level. And when you get him at the second level, man, he, he's just so much fun to watch. Mm -hmm. So knowing now that you've got a defense, an offensive line like you've never had before in those first six years of your career, that you're running behind one of the better offensive lines in all of football, I think that gives him a little bit of juice and the knowledge that, I can be really good behind these guys. These guys are going to get me to the second level. And I know that once I get to the second level, I can run people over. I can run around people. I can do a lot of things. He is the perfect fit for this team, for this offensive line, for them to really show out and show how good they can be as run blockers. And I think that element is now shaping this football team. And coaches are having to – as much as coaches want to throw the ball this day and age, mm -hmm. you do what works. You do what's successful. And the last couple of games, D, they have committed to running the football. Even in, in the game against the Bengals, early in the game, wasn't working really well, but they stuck with it. They committed to running the football. And then in the end, it really pays off. Why do you think we're seeing more of a trend this season? Teams across the National Football League are running the ball more. Well, yes. Why do you think that trend is taking shape now? It's all reciprocal. This thing just, you know, yeah. you, 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 and <clears throat> I, I think you're going to see more of that. And even the Eagles now, they play with a fullback. I know. They, they play with a fullback. Ben, Ben, uh, Ben, Ben Sumrin, who has, who's this tremendous athlete, yeah. linebacker, but they watch this guy in practice. Hey, let's give this a shot. Ben Sumrin loves it. And it is a perfect asset for this offense now to have a fullback. And I think it's because so many teams now are playing with smaller people, with smaller boxes. You know, you don't have the big thumper linebackers anymore. Mm -hmm. You don't have the Jeremiah Trotters who are 250 pounds in the inside at linebacker. You have these, these guys that are the size of Ike Reese that are 230 yeah. pounds. You know, they're kind of a slash between a safety and a linebacker. So, these are the types of people that you have. And so now, hey, let's put a bigger body in there. Put a hat on that that linebacker that's only 235 pounds and put him on his back, and we'll run right behind him. That's That, mm -hmm. to me, is what's happening now. Yeah, you're getting a lot of teams that, you know, they have these hybrid players at the second level that are not really linebacks, that are not really safeties. And that type of size – I think you can take advantage of in the run game when you put bodies on them. Go back to Saquon for just a moment because you have spent your entire career as a player and a broadcaster with this team. Yes. Is, the, is there any running back that you either played with or have watched from the booth that you could compare Saquon to? No. No. I don't, I don't have to hesitate, D, no. So I've seen a lot of guys who have a lot of, like, really cool stuff. Like Shady McCoy, unbelievable. And, you know, Shady, you could throw a handful of nickels at him and, and he could make them all miss. Yeah. Um, you've had guys who could run over people. You've had guys with tremendous speed. Westbrook was so good in the, in the open space. Um, Wilbur Montgomery was unbelievable, you know, tough as nails. Saquon can do everything. I saw him. I, I did see him. Uh, what I'm thinking about all that, all that he does. I'm thinking about a uh, protection where he didn't quite square up on the linebacker and the linebacker got around him. But 
other than that, I can't even think of anything that didn't go well with this guy. Well, the drop, but he catches the ball well. He's a really good pass protector. He's so good with the football in his hands. And they, on top of all that, he's such a great young man. Yeah. He's really good for the football team. You know, when they put him, they, they um, had him wired up, and you hear Nick Sirianni on the sideline with him at that Giants game. Yep. And Nick wants to know, hey, you're 13 yards from breaking your personal record in rushing. Do you want to go back? No. Let the young guys eat. Mm-hmm. And Nick asked him again, hey, hey, listen, if you want, I want, I want you to have this if you want that. No, I want the young guys to eat. It just speaks to the person that mm-hmm. he is. He is just a great teammate. And I think when everyone on the team, because they have heard it, everybody on the football team, when you hear things like that, when you see that type of attitude, I think it helps. I, I think it, it helps to shape who you are mm-hmm. as a football team. When you start to, that when that mindset starts to trickle throughout the organization, throughout your football team. I, I want to give some kudos and a shout out to fill in left tackle Fred Johnson. What? Like, because, what? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I got to give him a shout out because yeah. he, had, he had to go up against one of the better pass rushers in the NFL and Trey Hendrickson. Yeah. And on our pregame show with me and Seth Joyner and Mark Farzetta, we were chuckling about the fact that it was going to be a long day for Fred. Sure. And, I didn't hear Trey's name once. No. Do you think it was personal for, for Fred? Because he spent a couple of years in Cincinnati, and they deemed that he wasn't good enough to be with that team? Without a doubt, yeah. it, it gets personal. Just like yeah. Saquon the week before. Yep. Uh, everyone wants to talk about, uh, it's just a rate. No, it's personal. And, and Fred Johnson, I'm so glad you mentioned him because he played a great football game. Yes, he did. Not, not good. He, he played great. In the run game as well as in the passing game. There's and so they got to the point where they didn't have to put an extra guy over there on mm-hmm. Trey Henderson because they knew that Fred had this. Fred had him handled. They started the game with putting a tight end on that side to make sure you chip him, make sure you slow him down, so that you get him in front of Fred so Fred can handle him. As the game progressed, that wasn't even necessary. Mm. Fred Fred played an unbelievable game. And I think you have to give a lot of love to Jeff Stoutland. First of all, recognizing those types of players. Um, and even Tyler Steen, you know, for those guys to come in and back up roles, play the way they played, you know, that's that's the making of, of a really good football team. When you have at the next level guys who can come in and you're not hurt by those guys that have to come in. You know, we, we give Jeff Stoutland a lot of props for being able to work with so many different types of individuals when it comes to offensive linemen. From your perspective, do these guys come in here and have to adapt to his way of doing things, or is he smart enough to recognize the strengths and weaknesses, and which is incredible if he does, and adjust his mindset individually to each individual guy? So I think it's um, more the first part. Okay. I think Stoutland is really good in – assessing players before the Eagles even signed them. Mm. Now, Stotland will go and work guys out, and he looks for certain things. You know, I had a conversation with him, and he was talking about um, ankle flexibility in 300-pound men. He's talking about ankle flexibility in guys that are 340 pounds, 300-plus pound men, and that's one of the traits that he looks for how well they're able to flex in that area of their body. Mm -hmm. So when you get down to the little details like that and you know what to look for and you know little characteristics that are going to either make or break that guy and what you're going to ask him to do, yeah, you kind of know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. When you can, when you can break it down to some of the things that he looks for, some of the things that he, if you have a conversation with him, and he starts to talk about body types and what bodies can do. And you start to understand the Eagles don't um, go and sign a player to play in the trenches without having Stoutland go look at that guy and, mm. uh, and assess that guy because he knows exactly what he's looking for. Mm. That's, that's unbelievable. And, and I guarantee you, uh, Jalen Hurts was elated 
that Fred Johnson turned in the performance that he turned turned in protecting his blind side. And, and, and speaking of Jalen, Mike, I mean, the last three games, uh, no turnover, efficient. Yeah. The last couple of games in particular, utilizing the middle of the field, something yes. we've been screaming about. Um, where do you see Jalen in terms of how he has progressed uh, during this season? Because there had been a lot of criticism uh, thrown his way. Well, I don't think it's criticism just for the sake of criticizing him. I think um, I think there are plays that we look at it and we feel like he should have made. I think that there are situations that um, where he could have played better. So when you're an analyst, you talk about those things. It's not like a shot at him. It's just analyzing what's going on. And so you, you talk about those things. But Jalen, just like the offense, the defense, um, I think he's rounding into shape. Mm-hmm. you got a new system that he has to learn. Uh, and in these systems that, especially for a quarterback, there's so many little details. There's so many nuances. There's so many things that he has to process and he has to react to the, that processing of these things. It doesn't happen overnight. Oh, yeah, he's played quarterback before. So what? This is different. And what he's asked to do by Kellen Moore is a little bit different. There are little deal, little nuances in there that we don't all consider. And we yeah. don't all – it kills me sometimes when, when we're saying that, oh, he should have done this. We don't know what he should have done because mm-hmm. we don't know what he's asked to do in right. these plays. We can see a guy running open and expect that, oh, he should have gotten the ball to that guy. But do we really know? The answer is no, we don't. Mm-hmm. Um, why do you think the fan base and the media in a lot of ways is so indifferent towards Jalen? I've never been able to figure that out. Uh, quarterback. I think that was that way with Donovan. And I think Donovan was the best quarterback that this franchise has ever had, quite okay. honestly. And I think that you know, that era of football when Donovan was the quarterback in Philadelphia was the best era of football that I know. Mm-hmm. And I've been, I've been around here a long time. Um, but it was the same way. You know, a lot of people loved him, and a lot of people just like, you know, he's not the guy. And we're getting that with Jalen. Um, I think he's an unbelievable young man. I think you it's hard to have a much better face of, for your franchise. Mm-hmm. He's, uh, you know, you're not going to hear a bunch of crazy stuff about him. He's a guy who's about his business. Is he perfect? No. He never will be. But I, I, I would go to bat with that guy any day. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I um, don't want to make too much of it because it's still a topic of discussion. But for the life of me, we still can't figure out why this team has zero points on the board in the opening <laughs> quarter. Now, Cincinnati, oh, no, Cincinnati, in this case, they held the ball, went down the field 10 minutes, four Ten seconds with opening drop. So yeah. That's a little different. But this team not being able to put up points in the first quarter, Mark, I mean, Mike, it, it, I've gotten to a point now where I think it's humorous because all of a sudden the light switch goes on and they just take off after that. So you know what I say to that, D? And I hear everybody talking about that. Um, I don't care. Yep. (laughs) D, here's the deal. When they, listen, it would be nice to get points in the first quarter, but if they don't, and then they get points in the second, third, fourth quarter, to me what's most important is the fourth quarter. Yes. and, And being able to close out games. I would say this. Would you rather have the way they started the season last year and then ended the season with all of those losses or would you rather like build up to being who you are and then being able to finish yes i would take the latter i would take having a slow start in games but being dominant in the second half and being able to finish the game that's Mm. that's just me Mm. (laughs) you can't put it any simpler than that all right let's go to the other side and this defense is finally starting to yeah. get what Nick Fangio wants. I mean, they have quietly, quietly ascended to the eighth-ranked defense uh, in the NFL right now. What yeah. do you see from these guys starting to jail? Don't let folks know that. Yeah, really. <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, you're right. It's it's starting to get what Vic wants out of these guys. And Vic's starting to understand who he has. Yeah. So he he knows Nicobe Dean a whole lot better now than he knew him three months ago. He knows a lot about Nicobe Dean now because he has that history. 
He knows a lot about um, these young cornerbacks. He knows a lot about Zach Bond. He knows what Jordan Davis can do. Jalen Carter, he understands Jalen Carter and what he's able to do. That doesn't happen overnight. That mm. takes time, and it takes time on task. I got to see what these guys can do. I got to put these guys in these situations so I can see how they respond, how they come out of these situations. And now you're getting this um, infusion of all of this young blood. Cooper DeGene, Quentin Mitchell. You're getting all of these young guys. And I still say that uh, Blankenship is a young guy, only a couple of years in the league, maybe his third year. But you, you're getting all of this young energy. You know, looking at re reviewing the game from uh, Sunday, I'm yeah. looking at the, at the Bengals game, and the tackling was just phenomenal. And, you know, two, three weeks ago, we were talking about how bad the tackling was. And, you know, this is a football team. They That was a seven, their first drive, the Bengals, it was a 17-play drive. Yes. You know why it's a 17-play drive? Because generally when Burrow is hitting the number of pass re, uh, uh, receptions that he hit in that drive, somebody's going to break one. Somebody's going to break a tackle. They're going to slip and get through your defense, and they're going to run to the end zone because that's what they do. Uh, Chase, Jamar Chase is unbelievable in yeah. breaking tackles. His run after the catch ability is as good as anyone in football, mm. anyone. And so that's what they're counting on. And like, okay, we'll just get, they're going to give us a short one. We're going to take them. They go 17 plays. They go 17 plays because the Eagles tackling was so good. And Vic's starting to understand. They're starting to come together. And guys now know when, when Vic makes a call, they know what he's asking them to do now. Before, a little bit uncertain. So if you're a little bit uncertain, that could leave you a half a step shy. Right. And a half step shy in this league, you, you could lose the play. Mm -hmm. That's a loss for you on defense. If you're a step late, you lost on defense. And now they're starting to get it. They're starting to trigger. And they're triggering at the right time. You know, how much are you enjoying watching these young guys evolve, like, like Mitchell, DeJean, you know, um, a, a blank and ship. You know, yeah. then you get Isaiah Rogers back. You know, yeah. CJ, CJ, you know, CJ, GJ, he's not an older guy. But you got a good nucleus of seasoned veterans sprinkled in with a lot of young, hungry guys. I mean, I haven't seen a secondary like this, you know, in quite a while. And Avante Maddox is on the back burner. Yeah. <laughs> and I still think he's a great player, but he's on the yeah. back burner. You're right. Uh, it's fun. It really is. Because they're now, but they're also the future of this franchise. Yes. You've got so many, you've got a, a good handful of first year, second year players that they're going to be around here for a long time mm. and playing for a long time. You mentioned Rogers. I just think he, if he had to play all the time, you would see a lot of great plays out of Isaiah Rogers. Not like, I mean, the one you saw the one on Sunday against the Bengals, yes. but I think you'll see a lot of that out of him. That guy's speed, his reaction, the way he plays the ball in the air, you know, you, you, they're fortunate that they have Slay, but if Slay goes down, this team is in really good shape. And a lot of it is the young guys and the energy that they bring. When the young guys are bringing that energy, uh, it helps with uh, uh, and the older guys like a Brandon Graham and, mm -hmm. and others and Slay. You know, Slay knows that he's got to keep up with these young boys. <laughs> BG, BG knows that, hey, these young boys are bringing it, so I got to – so I got to show up sometimes too. You know, Slay, Slay's dealing with that knee injury, and you know we don't know what his status is for this coming Sunday's game against Jacksonville. Um, sh should Isaiah Rogers, Keely Ringo, who should be starting opposite of Mitchell? Oh, it'll be Rogers. It will, so, okay. Yeah, it'll be Rogers. And, and uh, Keely Ringo, I'm glad you mentioned him because that's just another one in the line of yeah. these, you know, second year guys that are going to be stud players. I don't think you lose a whole lot if Keely Ringo has to go in and play right now. No. That's just where this team is. So the roster looks really good on that end. And if you think about it, last year, this is one of the worst teams in football in terms of allowing the balls thrown over their head the ball, in the passing game. They're one, one of the worst. Now, you look at the way they play, yeah, I think it's one of the strengths of this defense. Mm. That, 
that they can get to the football, that they can, you know, even if you catch it, they make you pay. And, you know, you know the play that Slay made in the back of the end zone on Sunday, it's yeah. a touchdown. But Slay goes between the guy's hands, rips the football out, and, you know, they end up forcing them to kick the ball. That is the type of stuff that we're now seeing, like, in it's more prevalent now that they're making plays on the back end. You mentioned Zach Bond's name a little while ago, and man, how he got him on a cheap on a one-year deal for three and a half million. They better sign this young man real quick, Mike, to a long-term deal. Uh, he's leading the team in tackles, and he's blowing up plays left and right. Yeah, um, there again, D is being smart, understanding that. Okay, this guy has never played the position that he's playing now. They had him as just a rush in, an outside edge rusher. Right. So he comes to Philadelphia, and probably in the first couple of weeks, Vic Fangio said, hey, let's try this with him. And try this with him has turned into, like you said, the leading tackler on the team. Um, the guy flies around to the football. I think he loves now playing that new position, and it just fits him. Um that, that's important stuff, being able to recognize that, okay, he's got this talent, but let's see if he can do this. Mm. And, and, you know, that's what they've done now with Van Sumeren. I mentioned him earlier, who's now yes. a fullback. He's a, he's, a, a, he's a linebacker, and he's a special teamer, backup linebacker. But, hey, you know, this kid was a wide receiver in high school. He went yeah. to college as a fullback. Now he's a linebacker. You know, he's – the guy is just skilled. So let's see if we can do something with it. And Ben is loving playing fullback. Mm. It's really that, cool to watch. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. It's really hey, cool. Uh, 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 our old friend, Doug Peterson, coming to town Sunday. Yes. And bringing his, bringing his wounded Jacksonville Jaguars. Doug could be on the hot seat a little bit. Um, I don't know how much of the film you've had to see yet. You got a chance to see it on Jacksonville. But there's some shocking in a lot of ways that they're two and six right now. Is there anything to be worried about this team as they come to Lincoln Financial Field? So I think the the Eagles are in a good position, D, where they only need to worry about um, themselves and making sure that um, they stay on it. Whatever the calls are, let's just say stay fundamentally sound mm -hmm. and execute these calls and make sure that we're moving forward because they are. They're progressing in what they've been asked to do, mm -hmm. what they're asked to do each and every week. So I think if they just continue to detail their work and focus on them and not so much worried about, you know, whatever Jacksonville has. Um, I think Trevor Lawrence is a talented guy, but I just don't think that there's enough around him. Um, <clears throat> they, there's not enough. You know, when you think about the names that they have, Mm -hmm. There are not many names that you even know, you know. No. Et so Etn, but I, you know, but he hasn't been what they hope expected Travis Etn to be. No, that's a that's a football team that's in a lot of trouble, mm -hmm. and of course the head coach, our friend Doug Peterson, he's on the hot seat. You think he survives the season if, if their team continues to go the way it's going? I don't. Mm. I know. I, I think it helped him when he went to London and got the win there. Um, I think that extended him. I, I don't even know if he would have made it back from London had they not went when they went there. So yeah, they, you know, th that's what happens in this game. You either win or you're on your way out. Yeah, it's as simple yeah. as that. It's a game that. Um, what have you done for me lately? And you do have to win. And and if it doesn't matter if you won last year. You know, what are you doing right now? And if you're not getting it done, then then they have to try and seek sol solutions and get someone else. Sunday is a, a big day for a former Eagles running back, LaShawn yeah. McCoy. Yeah. He will be inducted into the Eagles Hall of Fame. Take a trip down memory lane and, and tell me what you remember most about Shady. As soon as you say that, I think about that snow game. Yes. Yeah, where he went for over 200 yards. But I... I <laughs> I just think he was one of the hardest players I've ever seen to hit and like in space. He wasn't Barry Sanders, but he was that type. When he got into space, you just couldn't hit him. It was hard to get a hand on him. 
the, you know, what was kind of surprising is how strong he was and his ability to even run the ball between the tackles and make it happen. But, but boy, he was just so much fun to see once you got him to the second level, just to make guys just fall out of their shoes trying to tackle him. You'd see guys just reaching and, you know, have no chance to get him because he's just so elusive in the open field. Um, happy for him, he and his family and all that. He'll go into the, to the Eagles Hall of Fame on Sunday. And that should be a big time for him. I hope he really um, appreciates, brings, you know, the people that love him, bring him in, let them see right. the love that he gets in Philadelphia because it's different. It's not like wherever he went and played, you know, after he left here, he'll never be able to get the type of love anywhere else that right. he's going to, that he's going to get in Philadelphia. I said that to our friend Seth Joyner years ago. Yeah. I said, Seth, you'll never get the love that you're going to get in Philadelphia anywhere else. You need to get back to Philadelphia and get in and you see where he is now. Yes. <laughs> he's, he's on the rise. Oh my goodness. Yes. Um, I'm going to take a quick trip around, uh, around the division. Um, are you surprised that Washington – now, Washington won a game on a fluke yeah. uh, Sunday night. But are they you surprised? Lost. They yeah. should have lost. Are you surprised this team's sitting at the top of the division right now? I am, but you know what? I, I think a lot of Dan Quinn, their head coach, yeah. and I know that he's a great defensive mind. So that part, um, not surprising, because I know they have some talented defensive players. But the offensive side and the young quarterback – that's really surprising. Um, you rarely see a quarterback come into the league and do what this kid is doing. Yeah, and it's very special. And it's to me, it's a lot of fun to see. I'm impressed. I like him. I like his demeanor. I think he's. I, I think this is something that he can do for a long time. Now he's got to get a little smarter and not take shots and not feel like he can. You know, you don't want to play hero stuff. You want to make sure that, you know, he's a valuable, valuable asset. Yes. He has to make sure that he's not taking unnecessary shots because he has a small frame and he can get hurt. So the, the rib injury that he got, I didn't think that that was necessary. He's got to make sure that he's not taking shots because he can do this for a long, long time at an extremely high level. He's really good. Does it do your heart well to see the Dallas Cowboys stumbling around like they are right now? <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah. I. Uh, so I can. I like. I do like their quarterback. I like Dak. Okay. But but just the organization in general. Yeah. Too arrogant. Too much. Everything. They're too much. When you go to that stadium down there, it's just too much. It's excess. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I'm. I, I'm not hurt over the fact that they are in the position that they're in. Not at all. Hey, and, the Giants, yeah. and the Giants, they're, you know. I don't even talk about the Giants. They're yeah. bad. They are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they're not you know, They're not going anywhere either. They're, they're quarterback. They decided to play the pay the wrong person. Yes. They should have kept the running back face of the franchise and paid him. Yeah. They, they look so bad. They have such a bad look, that whole mm. um, hard knocks thing. Yes. And then you know, then Saquon go in there and just you know, oh, that that just looked really bad, bad for that whole organization. I don't feel bad for him, but it yeah. just looked awful. Hey, my final question to you has nothing to do with football. Go back to the 2017 season. Of course, they they win the Super Bowl in 2018, and, and Mike Quick is one of several uh, Eagles who make a, a cameo appearance on a show called The Goldbergs. You know. <laughs> Uh, and, yeah. and, and have you gotten the acting bug out of your system or do you still think you could be the next Denzel or, you know, do, has anybody ever approached you with acting again since then? The, I, that is not me. Huh? That, is, that is not my cup of tea. It was fun. Yeah. So we, we went out to play the Rams. So we spent the entire week out there mm -hmm. and I got a call about a month before going out there um, about uh, being on an episode of the Goldbergs. So I thought it was, fun i thought it was exciting and it was fun so i said yes and i went out and had a great time the two days that i was on set um but man there's a whole lot of work for nothing i mean for like a little <laughs> like but um but it was cool 
But yeah. it, that's not my cup of tea. I'm not. I'm not an actor. No. All right. All right. He is former Eagles great. He is a star of stage and screen. He is a color analyst for your Philadelphia Eagles. He is the one and only Mike Quick. Mike, I, I thank you so much, man. And and don't be surprised you get a call from me down the road to talk some more Eagles on Gun on One. Dave, much love to you, brother. Anytime. I'm on. I appreciate it, my man. All right, that's going to wrap up this edition of Gun on One. For Mike Quick, I'm Derek Gunn. We will see you next week after the Eagles beat down the lowly Jacksonville Jaguars. Until then, so long, everybody.